I shall be, and thy God, my God. Where thou, I will, and there will I be, now. This is a determined mind. Which is what God doesn't have with us too often. She said, I don't care. Where you go, I'm going. Where you lodge, I'm lodging. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Where you die, I plan to die. Where you are buried, that's where I want to be buried. The Lord do so to me and more. Finish the verse. If aught but death, finish it. Now, why did I direct us to that passage? That's what God wants from us in our relationship with Him. We must say to Jesus, With our voice, I will go. With our largest, I will lodge. Thy God shall be my God. Thy people shall be my people. With our diest, I will die. With our buried, I will be buried. In other words, we must give to God a mind that is made up to follow Him regardless of circumstance. Let me tell you something about the Apostle Paul. Let's go to Acts 9. In just a few minutes and I'll close. Acts 9. God sends Saul to uh, Damascus to a Christian called Ananias. Ananias says, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how great things he has done to thy sins at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the priest, the chief priest, to bind all that call on thy name. And God said, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Verse 16 says what? For I will do what? Show him, keep reading, read loudly, how great things, go on, he must suffer, finish the verse, for Ah, here is what happened. Here is, Mr. Cameraman, I moved around, sorry, man. sorry. God says to Ananias, I will show him what he will suffer. Now, it's one thing to suffer when it comes on you, you're not expecting it. But to have God outline it, and then you decide, yes, I'm going. That's commitment. And you read what Saul said he suffered. He's beaten by the Jews, shipwrecked, robbed, stoned, bitten by a poisonous snake. He lists all the things that happened to him and clearly he saw. All these things would happen. Many people when they come to God, they come to God because they hope their way will be made easy. I'll get food, I'll get clothes, I'll get a house, rich members will give me money, I'll get a husband, I'll get a wife, whatever. God said to Paul, when you come to me, you'll be shipwrecked. You'll be beaten more than once, 40 stripes less one. You'll be robbed as you walk in to preach. Snakes will bite you. People will attack you. You'll run for your life. Now here's Paul listening to all of this. And God might as well have said, do you still want to go? What did Paul say? Yes. I'll go for you. Amen. My brothers and sisters, Ruth said, where you go? Now, did Ruth know what Palestine was like? No. She only knew that woman is a godly woman. Where you go, I'm going. Where you lodge, I'm lodging. Just let me be with you. Your God, my God. Your people, my people. Where you die, I want to die. Where you're buried, now that is oneness with a person. Are you with me? Yes. Now we are to be one with Christ. Amen. Where Christ goes, where's Christ? That's where we want to go, right or wrong. Where he lodges, where is he lodging? His God shall be my God. Who's his God? The Father. His people, my people, who are his people? Modern Israel, those who obey God's commandments. Where he died, let me die. Calvary, by dying to self. Where he's buried, let me be buried. And God do so to me and more 
is on but death. Pardon me from Jesus. My brothers and sisters, my appeal to you on the last few minutes of what has been a blessed event in my life. Are you serious with God? You don't have to answer me. Let me make a brotherly proposal. Either get serious with God or leave God alone. If you're a Seventh-day Adventist, be a Seventh-day Adventist. Do not be an Adventist Baptist, an Adventist Pentecostal, an Adventist Catholic, or Adventist Mormon. Because I've never seen a Mormon Adventist. I've never seen a Pentecostal Adventist. But I've seen many Adventist Pentecostals. Be what God has called us to be. Representatives of what is known as present truth that no one else knows and no one else can teach. In uh, Last Day Events, page 45, paragraph 2, we read these words. Seventh day Adventists have been chosen by God as a peculiar people, separate from the world. With the great cleaver of truth, he has cut them out from the quarry of the world and brought them into connection with himself. He has made them his representatives and called them to be ambassadors for him in the last work of salvation. The greatest wealth of truth ever entrusted to mortals. The most solemn and fearful warnings ever sent by God to men have been committed to them to be given to the world. There is no other church that promotes the Ten Commandments like the Seventh-day Adventist Church. There is no other church that insists on the Seventh-day Sabbath like the Seventh-day Adventist Church. My brothers and sisters, as Seventh-day Adventists, we have a serious duty to the world to prepare the world for the second coming of Christ. Even as the Jews have a responsibility to prepare the world for the first coming of Christ and they failed. So when Christ came, even though he had a nation on earth, only a few shepherds knew. And they only knew the same night. The only people who knew were long before were the three wise men who lived hundreds of miles away. But they studied the scrolls. Christ is coming the second time. The first time he came, there was probation. There was mercy, he came to save. The second time, he's not coming to save from sin. He's coming to take those who are already saved, to take them home with him, and to destroy the way. We are the voice to let the world know that the world is suffering because the law of God has been set aside. The law of God has been violated, and God withdraws his favor wherever his law is disregarded. He does not withdraw it suddenly, he withdraws it gradually, but he withdraws it. And he is still withdrawing his favor from this world, but his favor must remain among his faithful people. Amen. I call upon you in the name of Jesus. Be serious with God or leave God alone. And so tonight, I appeal to you in the name of Jesus. Will we not now make a recommitment to God, Father? Help me to be a faithful, obedient, Seventh-day Adventist Christian. Or let me make it more general. Help me to be an obedient child of yours, faithful unto death. Revelation 2.10 Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee what? A crown of life. Was Jesus faithful unto death? Was John the Baptist faithful unto death? Was Paul faithful unto death? Was Peter crucified upside down, faithful unto death? Yes. Were all the martyrs faithful unto death? Yes. This is not a strange request. Faithful unto death. Let me put it more bluntly. It is better to die than to disgrace God. It is better to starve than to work on something. It is better to live a lonely life than to marry outside the church. Amen. It is better to have no degree 
You have to do your exams on God's holy day. Amen. Be thou faithful unto death. The weakness of the church is because so many of us are this way with God. And the church is just weak, powerless, which makes God look bad. Because then we seem to have a powerless God. But my brothers and sisters, when you understand what Jesus suffered on that cross, for you as an individual, for me as an individual, Christ died for me as if I am the only person who ever sinned. I'm the only sin on earth. He died for me personally. That's the way you must see it. God loves you. He wants you in his kingdom. Not only that, he wants your children in his kingdom. He wants your relatives in his kingdom. He wants to use you to bring your family. In John 7 verse 5, the Bible says, the brethren of Jesus did not believe in him. They didn't. For a while, before he died, they believed. And so two of his brothers wrote books of the Bible. But during his ministry, his family did try to stop him. Mark 3.21, because they said he's beside himself, he's mad, doing all this preaching. The mother, the brothers, that they came to, the Bible says, lay hold on him. Because they did not understand. When God called Abraham from Ur of the Chaldees, his family members and friends did not understand. But he understood. Because God called him. And so I say to you, as a young girl said to me in Massacre in 2001, my very first evangelistic series in Uganda, she said, Pastor, I was a Muslim. I never knew all that I learned in this meeting. 16. She said, I am getting baptized. I don't care what my family says. That's what the three Hebrew boys said. We are not bowing. We don't care what you do. Daniel said, I am not eating that. I don't care what you do. Joseph said, I'm not sleeping with you. I don't care what your husband does. When God has people like that, the devil has lost. Amen. I mean, he has lost. Amen. The intimidating factor is gone. And so I'm saying to you, let us make a decision. Father, help me to be faithful to you regardless of the cost. That's my commitment. I raise my hand. Anyone will join me. Stand up with me. Let me ask you a couple of questions. Very simple. When a person is hungry, what does the person want? When a person is thirsty, what does the person want? If a person is drowning, what does the person want? Let me say. Does that change with culture? No. No. When a law is hungry, what does he want? When a Giso is hungry, what does he want? When a Muganda is thirsty, what does he want? When an American is drowning, what does he want? Same. What am I trying to say? Don't let tribes divide you. Our basic needs are the same. Our problem is the same. Same. It has nothing to do with tribe. And our solution is the same as that, Christ. Remember that and rise above this annoying emphasis people place on tribe. There are two tribes on the face of the earth. Obedient and disobedient. Christ Object Lessons, page 283, paragraph 3, everybody writes, there are only two classes in the world today and only two classes will be recognized in the judgment. Those who violate God's law and those who obey. Shall we join the obedient tribe today? Can I see your right hand? That's the only tribe that counts. Father in heaven, we thank you, dear God, for the two weeks you have spent. You have protected us. You have enlightened us. You have blessed us. You have reclaimed some. Dear God in heaven, wherever I failed you, wherever I have preached badly, I ask you to forgive me. Help me to do better than my next assignment. But I thank you publicly, God for this tremendous privilege to be here in a place that I love so much, to serve you and to serve your people. I pray that the word spoken will long remain in the hearts of your people, my brothers and sisters of Uganda and those visiting from elsewhere. Bless Mount Olive's day, God. Let your spirit have his way. Bless KCC, the senior church. Bless Pastor Lubwama, whose burden it is to carry those churches. Bless his assistant, Pastor Emmanuel, dear God. 
Bless the elders, I pray. Bless all the officers. Bless the membership, Father. Help them to understand that faithfulness is the basis of all your blessings. Now, dear God, as we leave, let us go conscious of the fact that we are members of the obedient tribe. Because that's the tribe of which Jesus is the head. Bless this country. Bless our President Museveni. Give him wisdom, dear God, that the decisions he and his officers make may be advantageous to the work of the gospel. Bless all the non adventist friends who have come to be with us. Father, guide their lives. Take care of them, dear God, and bring truth to their hearts. Bless their families. Bless their children, dear God. Let the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Uganda be a light to this country. Let it be an example of right living to this country, dear God, so that when you come, we might be saved and those who will be inspired by our lives. I offer this prayer from my heart. In Jesus' name and for his sake, let all God's people say, Amen, amen. and Amen. Let's sing 26 the final time. Sing them over again to me. Wonderful words of life. All three stanzas.
Please come and join us. Do the chaplain at some high school come? Let's surround God's people and we'll pray. results of these two weeks, the full results may not be seen until we cross over the other side. Father, I pray now in the name of Jesus, one more time, cleanse our hearts, dear God. Give us a love for that which is right, just because it is right. As Abraham said to you in Genesis 18, 25, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Father, a righteous person does what is right just because it is right not because it's easy convenient or profitable just because it is right and right doing is pleasing to you and so father we pray in the name of jesus that you would look upon us now with favor unbounded favor i present to you today god those who are baptized your word says in acts 2 38 peter said repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Father, they've repented. They've been baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Now, dear God, it's time for you to keep your part of the bargain. Father, with all respect, I ask in the name of Jesus, keep your word. Grant them your spirit, dear God. You've said in Luke eleven thirteen, if ye then be evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children. How much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask? We are asking, dear God, grant us your Spirit now. Place your Spirit according to individual need in every heart of every person who is baptized, that that Spirit may be a down payment of the greater infilling to come as they live obedient lives day by day. Father in heaven, let the greatest love be to please you. Let the faithful lives inspire others to come to you. Post angels around them, dear God, to shield them from harm and danger. Keep them faithful so that when you come, they may all be saved. And for those who are contemplating baptism at the next appointed time, sustain them in their decision, dear God. For those